the speakers that have and will stand before you, I am most familiar with the one that will stand before you next. It is my father, both in the flesh and in the faith. And he is a dear and precious companion in Ruth the glory. While we have made considerable progress together, together we have forged rivers of unspeakable depths. We have stood in furnaces of fire together and have exited without the smell of smoke on our clothes. We have mounted up with eagles' wings when flight seemed illogical. We have skipped upon the mountains of perception with gladness together, although we have walked through the valley of the shadow of death, and yet feared no evil. It should not surprise me in the ages to come. As the eternity rolls her ceaseless cycles on, that my beloved father and I should not join in some joint enterprise for which we are now being suited and Amen. So it is with great joy that I introduce to you my, my father, Brother Fred O. Blake. While I'm assisting him here, if someone would mind turning this light up a little bit here to assist him with his speech.
council going on in the in eternity between the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, and uh, who then was not the Son, he was the Word. In the beginning was the Word on an equality with God. But the eternal Word steps forward and says, as it were, I'll go. I'll volunteer. They go down to those low grounds of sin and sorrow and degradation, and I'll suffer and bleed and die and give my life for the ransom of the world. This is a clear doctrine of Scripture, of course, that uh, God sent the Son to be the Savior of the world. And, of course, he sent him with his complete and entire consent. And the, the Son came and with that act, full acquiescence to the Father's will. And so he goes ahead there to, to, to state that, uh, that, that in, in, the, in the course of time, and, of course, that the, the Son came, and the grand scheme of redemption began, began to unfold. So we have this, uh, this text and this subject tonight. Uh, this, this is life. This is life eternal. The, the redemption that is in Christ Jesus, of course, is the hope of a lost world, a world that's been estranged from God by, by sin and its, its separation from God. Uh, Jesus himself, himself said that I am the good shepherd that layeth down or lay down my life for the sheep. Uh, and over and again, the Apostle John uh, tells us of the, uh, the prophecy there of Jesus as he envisioned the, we're told that toward the close of his life that he set his face steadfastly towards Jerusalem, knowing that he must go up to accomplish that for which he came into the world. The, uh, one of the great uh, mysteries of the, of the life of Christ and one of the great uh, shadows, I think, that hung over his life from the time of his uh, awareness, we're not sure just at what time it dawned upon his spirit that he was the Lamb of God that had been sent to take on his human spirit. He was human and divine, we understand. We're not sure at just what time that dawned upon his human spirit that he was the appointed sacrifice for a world, but certainly from that time on, that shadow of the cross must have, must have weighed heavily upon him. And I think we, that's why we read in the prophecy of Isaiah, in the third chapter, that he was a man of sorrows and a funny degree. The uh, concept to foster in some quarters of a sort of a convivial type Lord Jesus, who was always the life of the party, it seems to me cannot find justification in Scripture. He was a, a sober man. He had came on a sober eternal mission. And I'm sure that the particular as in the, in the latter few years of his life, as he drew near to the cross, uh, that weighed heavily uh, upon his heart. We know in the Garden of Gethsemane, he said, my soul is exceedingly sorrowful even unto death, uh, and as the shadow of the cross loomed out there. So the, the idea perhaps entertained in some quarters that Jesus took this mission, well, as to, to use the language of the street, sort of took it in stride. It is an erroneous concept. Mm -hmm. He was human. We know that even in the Garden of Gethsemane that he prayed earnestly, agonizing me three times, sweating as it were great drops of blood falling down to the ground, that it were possible to let for God to let this cup pass from him. Nevertheless, that's his name, he said, which we must learn to say, nevertheless, not thy will, but thine be done. I mention that to show you the humanity of our Lord Jesus Christ. He was as fully human as he was divine. That's the mystery of the Incarnation. He was the God-man, holy, holy man, and holy God at the same time. But that, that humanity of Jesus suffered, and he was, he was made perfect by the things which he suffered. And bless God, being made perfect, he became the author of eternal salvation. Praise yeah. his name unto all them that obey him. You know, I can't preach the gospel without sort of praising God along the way. I hope you will be prepared with me here. 
is I get into the Spirit not only on the Lord's day, but on any day, I find my spirit exalted and lifted up. And I won't just say hallelujah. You know, it is in order. That is a good Bible word. And we find it in, in, in the Revelation. And we just ought to get so so caught up. You know, you know what John said? John said, I, I was in the spirit of the Lord's day. Well, bless God, it's a good place to be on the Lord's day or any other day. Because it gives you to escape uh, the depressing, many times, circumstances of this life and to just rise up. You know, we are, we, we have been told, we are told by inspiration that we've been raised up and made to sit together in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. And again, we're told, even David knew this. And I'll say, even David, David was a man after God's own heart, but he was a man born out of due season, so to speak, in the diction of the Apostle Paul. But he said that uh, in thy presence is fullness of, of joy, and at thy right hand there are pleasures forevermore. So we need to, to imbibe something of the, another place that I think it was Nehemiah who said, the joy of the Lord is thy strength. And I know you can't work this up, but don't get me wrong. We're not talking about conviviality. We're talking about the genuine, bona fide joy of God, the joy of the Holy Spirit. The fruit of the Holy Spirit, you will recall, is righteousness, peace, and joy. So it, it's something that, uh, that actually is let down from heaven into your spirit as you, by faith, Behold the glory of God, and behold the, the grandeur and the, the absolute sufficiency of the eternal redemption of, of ourselves that the Lord Jesus Christ has obtained for us. I like what Hebrews, how Hebrews puts it there. He said, he has entered Christ, the subject is Christ. He entered once into the holy place, that's heaven itself, having obtained eternal redemption for us. You know, I I believe in eternal redemption. In fact, I have it. <laughs> By God's grace, I am a possessor of eternal redemption yeah. in the Lord Jesus Christ. I mention that because a lot of people are not sure at this point. They go missing along to life and sort of a hope so basis. I'm I'm trying, but you don't try to be saved. Mm -hmm. You can just try as hard as you want to, and you'll never have the joy of salvation. Yeah. Salvation was purchased and procured for you by the sacrifice of Jesus Christ, as Brother Burnett has pointed out. And all you have to do, and I do say all you have to do, is receive it. God was in Christ reconciling the world unto himself, not imputing their trespasses unto them, and has committed unto us the ministry of reconciliation, as though God were Christ was God was in Christ with us, we beseech you in Christ's stead. Be you reconciled to God. For God has made, I like the American standard in the given in the King James, uh, God has made him who you know sin to be sin for us that we might become the righteousness of God in him. Amen. 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 I, uh, it is with the point that's been made before today and this, yesterday, but let it be a fair repetition. Uh, this is a requirement uh, that we must have in order to appear before God. We cannot appear before God except as we are absolutely righteous. God is, is, is a prophet. He said, he's of pure eyes and to behold iniquity and, and, and the whole sin and, and cannot look upon iniquity. So if you're going to enter into the holy place, so we're told uh, that having washed our garments, uh, we're to have holiness to enter into the holy place by the blood of Jesus. Amen. Over, as Hebrews 10, 19 and following, over the new and living way which he, that is Christ, had consecrated for us through the veil, that is to say, his flesh, and the sacrifice of his flesh put away sin, put away sin by the sacrifice of sin, that is to say, his flesh, and having a high priest over the house of God, let us go in here with, with a true heart and full assurance of faith, having our hearts sprinkled from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with true water. I don't know how that strikes you, but that's, that's such a joyful sound to me. That's a joyful note. Because by his grace I've come to love God. 
And I, I want to draw an idea that God is my father. Uh, God has, has so loved me and the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him shall not perish but have, have, have everlasting life. I love him. I said, why do you, I love God because of the revelation of himself that has been given to me in the scriptures. I don't know anything that does anyone else it claims to the contrary notwithstanding. I don't know anything about God, nor does, does anyone else that is not revealed and contained in the Bible. Amen. Any claim to the contrary is mere superstition. But that's not, that certainly doesn't place any limitation upon our knowledge of God, because there's so many wonderful and glorious things. Brother Burnett has just read some of those three tonight about our Heavenly Father. I, I'm not voted for antidote, but it's hard to, to refrain from one now and then, <laughs> as, as the Holy Spirit gives it to me. I, I love to preach in the power of the Holy Spirit. I've got an outline here, but I don't think I'm going to get to it. <laughs> <laughs> I recall, I recall a, a story that Brother Thomas Campbell, who was a saint of the Lord, and if you've ever, ever read any, any of the life of Thomas Campbell, he, he was a, 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 a saint of God. It, judging by the fruit that he bore. And he, he tells the story uh, of the death of his wife. And she was, uh, she was nearing death, and it said that uh, he, he bent over her bed, uh, and she said to him, she called him daddy, I believe, a father, I guess back in those times, a little more formal. She said, father, what, what do you think of my condition? Well, he wasn't... Uh, this Pollyanna type of thinking that we have so much of today, he was a realist. So he bent over to her and he put his arm around her neck and he said, My dear, you're very shortly going into the presence of our gracious Heavenly Father. Now that's realism. And so she just simply relaxed, relinquished her life and taken on the wings of the angels. Well, Lazarus was, so I presume Sister Gavin was. And since Lazarus died, he was carried by the angels into Abraham's bosom. But this is what I'm talking about, the, the, the absolute confidence in, in God that will pull you up for the trials and stresses, and there are some of them, if you haven't encountered them yet, why just to buy your time. They <laughs> know they will come. It is written. Amen. It is written that we shall do much tribulation in the kingdom. Amen. Amen. All in Barnabas came along very known acts, and they said that they testified and exhorted the saints uh, to continue in the faith, and that we shall through much tribulation. Talk about the eternal kingdom, the end of the kingdom. I have often thought, uh, and I don't, I wouldn't care to undertake a debate on the subject, but I have often thought in my opinion becomes increasingly confirmed that there won't be anybody in that eternal city that hasn't gone by the way of suffering. Amen. Christ was made perfect by the things which is not the, the manner of suffering I understand would vary, but I, I, he thinks, as they used to say, that there won't be anyone there who has not tasted the bitter cup of suffering by the which our, our blessed Lord himself was made perfect. So these are are some of the things that uh, uh, sustain my heart. That we, we know that uh, I like I like the perspective of the apostle here, that apostolic perspective. I commend that to you. You know, he said uh, we were quoting there now from from Second Corinthians, and the the sixth the sixth chapter, I believe it is. He said these light afflictions. Now they weren't light. This is a an apostolic euphemism, all the great on euphemistic language. For instance, in First Corinthians, he said that, uh, uh, in talking about the, the, he said about the Israelites, you know, they about the Exodus, exit from Exodus from Egypt. Actually, there there were five hundred and ninety-nine thousand nine hundred and ninety-eight of these people that didn't get out, they didn't make it to Canaan. But Paul, in harking back to that in 1 Corinthians 10, he says, with well, some of them, God was not well pleased. <laughs> <laughs> the characteristic of Paul, the humanistic one, he's really related, you see. And so he said, uh, these life afflictions, you know, he enumerates from the 11th chapter of 2 Corinthians, he enumerates them about 
five times and received that forty stripes, saved from the one. I don't know how land Christ has got shipwrecked, and he, he enumerates at least a, uh, something of the privations and sufferings that he encountered for the Lord Jesus Christ. And yet he said, now this, brethren, we've got to get this. This is in the perspective of the joy set before him. This is how you, this, you run with patience the race that is set before you, looking unto Jesus. He says, these lack afflictions, which are but for a moment. Praise God. Amen. Amen. Working for us a far more. I, I like to play on the words there. He didn't say just more. I would settle for that. These glad afflictions, which are what for a moment worked for us, a far more exceeding and eternal weight of glory. But in his condition, that's not the natural view. Why? They work, they so work. Why? We look not upon the things that are seen, but upon the things that are not seen. For the things that are seen, they're temporal. But the things that are not seen, bless God, they're eternal. Amen. Amen. Someone has said, uh, blessed is the man, the dying man, who can see in the dark. <laughs> the darkness of nature. And so this is the thing we're talking about. It's the faith of God's elect. We, we, don't, we don't shout even that word elect. It's, it's a good Bible term. Amen. Amen. The elect are just, are just the people whom God before the world began knew but of their own free will and accord, except Jesus Christ and continuing and steadfast to live. That's what the elect are. <coughs> he didn't do any arbitrary determining of the matter. He just in his omniscience. He, he knew before the world began how the whole thing was going to turn out. Uh, and then uh, he provided the gospel and provided for his proclamation and then those who hear the gospel have the option of, of accepting or rejecting those who reject it and abide and as Jesus said he, he that endureth unto the end of saying shall be saved and I like to let all this together be thou faithful unto death and I will give unto thee a crown of life well that's uh, that's some of the, the things that cross my mind as I get in the spirit of the Lord's there any other time and get to talking about the things of God. There, there's plenty of, uh, plenty of subject matter, plenty of subject matter as you're in the Spirit and begin to, to meditate and rely upon uh, the exceeding great and precious promises. Our brethren have been working that text there in Second Peter over. Not, not overly working, but they haven't been working it over, and there's a difference. <laughs> uh, and uh, these exceeding great and precious promises whereby we're made partakers of the divine nature, having elected partnership because they're having escaped the corruption that is in the world through us. Besides this, getting all the diligence is over. So we read glory in these exceeding great and precious promises uh, because they become the, uh, the incentive, the compelling, constraining incentive to get us to work the glory. Someone has said that... Um, some of the old timers in the restoration movement, some of the literature I have, that they, they had reduced it to, they said God had, uh, had two means of getting people from, from, great, from, uh, from, from the earth to, to heaven. And, and the first one was the exceeding great and precious promises. They were, uh, by those we, we become protectors of divine nature, we believe them and cling to them. And we liken them to the locomotive uh, that sometimes we see them in trains that are heaven to today. today. That have a local uh, engine in front and pulling and one behind pushing. So this uh, these exceeding great and precious promises where they uh, constitute the lead locomotive. They're pulling us. They're pulling us to glory. That's God. I, uh, that, uh, that's uh, that doesn't blend in with some of the mysticism of this place today. But it's it's Bible doctrine that we we are we are constrained by the promises God makes. Uh, these become the insidia uh, that begets faith and continuity in that faith and perseverance in the faith. And behind this, uh, this, this loaded train is, are the warnings, uh, the threats and the warnings that sort of push you along. And we need a moment, brethren. We need a moment. It is a fearful thing. If, if we depart from the faith, Hebrews 10, after having uh, accepted the, the faith and confessed it and embraced it, if we uh, later fall away, he said, and, uh, and and repudiate the faith. He said, it's a fearful thing to fall into the hands of the living God. Mm -hmm. And so over and again, of course,
course, the epistles are the ones of the Lord Jesus himself. Uh, and his doctrine are filled with these warnings that uh, uh, serve a great problem. I, I, I have, uh, I've obtained, I've, I've lived in grace quite a while, brethren, but I haven't uh, graduated from the ministry of the warnings. Now, I'll tell you, hell sounds like an awfully horrible place to me. I don't want to go there. Yeah. I, my country says, I know I'm not going there, but I don't want to go there. And that's, that's, if you don't, um, Paul says, knowing the terror of the Lord, it becomes a constraining uh, factor in our evangelistic fervor, too. Knowing the terror of the Lord, we persuade men. And he said, I became all, all thanks to all men, if by any means I may, might save some. And Jude says, hey, and others save as by pulling, save by, by pulling them out of the fire. Save the fear, pulling them out of the fire. So we don't want to get to, Get away from the from the Bible. The Bible's filled with these these uh, negative you might call them negative elements of maybe you won't say the gospel, but negative elements of the situation in which we're involved anyway. And that is uh, the uh, the hazard. Maybe you will, maybe you will say it's too strong a word, but at least of the possibility of having put our hand to the plow, looking back and being rejected of God. Now that is entirely possible. But I'm not worried about that because the grace of God is sufficient. Uh, and I know that he is able to keep that which I have committed unto him against that day. And after all, I, I just praise God for the way he unfolds these things to your spirit. And as you walk with him, who wants to go back to that song back there? I, 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 I love it in that mind. I know what... See, we, I've got, and you have, if you've tasted of the heavenly gift, and the made the things of the Holy Spirit, and the powers of the Word of come, that is applicable to us, Hebrews 6, you know. And all of us, those five elements still apply to us there. Mm -hmm. and, and if you've done that, uh, then who wants to go back to that former way of life, the dog to his vomit, and the sow that was washed to her wallowing in the mire? So uh, I just, uh, I just throw the, somebody said that, uh, uh, we just throw, the, throw the, 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 uh, the bag into the devil's face as he, he is. He, he, he stalks about. I like one of those verses. He stalks about as a roaring lion seeking whom, whom he may devour. But we, we, just, we just cast a god that in his face and, and said, Get thee hence. We, we know you and we've tasted of better things. And I'll tell you, in, in, that, in that experience, the experience of God's grace, the experience of the indwelling Godhead, Godhead uh, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. He said, uh, then you can, you can triumph. In fact, it becomes easy. You know, it, it, Jesus said, my yoke is easy. <coughs> and I've heard him, but in burning his light. I think sometimes we, young people especially in the church, they get, uh, that they dwell too much on the, on the austerity of the, of the demands of Jesus. And he is an austere man from, Depends on how you how you regard it. From the from the flesh to stand what he is austere. And he demands that you crucify the flesh, in fact. Yet that would come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. And he that does not bear his cross and come after me cannot be my disciple. Now the cross is simply that instrument upon which you crucify the natural man with his unlawful appetites, his unlawful desires. Uh, and, and follow Christ. Uh, but on the other hand, he said, my yoke is easy, and my burden is light. So it depends on which side of the cross you view the situation. Yeah. Amen. Uh, Amen. Uh, you see, you've got, uh, as someone has said, that he said, take my yoke upon you, and learn to be my meek and old in heart, uh, and my yoke is easy, and my burden is light. But the, the, the secret here is, and I trust you've discovered that, that Jesus is in the yoke with you. He's a yoke fellow. Yeah, and that's that's what makes it easy. That he walks all, all the way by your side. I'll tell you that now. Uh, you know, Paul calls it the communion of the Holy Spirit, the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ. One of the great apostolic benedictions. If you haven't learned it yet, I commend it to you. Second Corinthians, the thirteenth chapter. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you now and forever. Now that communion of the Holy Spirit is Christ in you. It is the Father in you. You know, Jesus said, if a man love me, he'll keep my words, uh, and I will love him, and will manifest myself unto him. 
And he went ahead to us in John 14, a little further down in the 23rd verse. He said, uh, He that uh, commands on me, uh, keep my father will love him, and we, the father and the son, will come unto him and make our glory of him. Now that's what Paul is talking about. Uh, we're building together in, in Corinthians, the third chapter, the 16th, and the sixth chapter. We're, we're building together for inhabitation in Ephesians, Ephesians, the second chapter. We are building together for an habitation of God through the Spirit. Someone has said that what is the most uh, overwhelming thought that ever crossed your mind? They asked some philosopher, some Christian philosopher that, and he quickly replied, the fact that I am indwelt by the Godhead. Amen. And to me, I, I can acquiesce to that. The, and and the, now this is not visionary, brethren. This is not wishful thinking. This is the doctrine of Scripture, and it's the experience of God's people. I will walk in them and dwell in them, and they shall be my people, and I will be with them and be their God. That, now that's, that's in 2 Corinthians 6, 16, but it's, a, it's a, a, an illusion. It's not a very great illusion. Quotation, but it's allusion to action or to Leviticus 11:3, where the same promise, in essence, or in a preliminary way, not, not in essence, but in a preliminary way, was made to Israel. That I will, I will cast my tabernacle among them, and I will dwell among them. And in the Shekinah glory there, in the in the in, in the temple, in the holy, the holy of holies, the, the, the God did symbolically dwell there with, in, over the mercy seat in the Shekinah glory. But that was typical. Now in the church age, now that Christ has gone back to heaven, been glorified, and sins have been put away, and the Holy Spirit has been given, this is this is a real thing that I will dwell in them and walk in them. And you you you, you parallel that with Revelation 21, 3, which is the ultimate. We have the first two. So we actually have the first two of heaven. I trust that you know that. Why not? We've been raised up and made to sit together in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. In fact, I like Moffat's translation of that Philippians, that is part of that Philippians 33 there, where we are, uh, the, the, the American standard, then exactly where our citizenship is in heaven. Moffat says that, that we are, renders that, we are a colony of heaven. I like that. Mm-hmm. We are not hosts of heaven by God's grace. We, we are, we are, we are first, we've been take, partaken of the first fruits. Now, the first fruits are genuine specimen of the full harvest. And so uh, we, in, in Revelation 21, 3, you have almost a verbatim a repetition of, of 2 Corinthians 6, 16. It, there he said that, that uh, the ta- behold, the tabernacle of God. And this, this, is, this is the climax. This is after this world has passed away and the new heavens and the new earth have been revealed. I saw a new heaven and a new earth wherein and there was no more sea. And he said, the lady saw it coming down from God out of heaven. And he said, Behold, the tabernacle of God is with them, and he will be with them. And God shall, God shall be their people, be with them, and they shall be his people, and God himself will be with them and be their God. So that's what the, the ultimate of which we now have the foretaste. And I'll tell you, if, you, if you've tasted of this heavenly gift, in the language of Hebrews 6, and then made partakers of the Holy Spirit, tasted of the good word of God and the power of the world to come, that's uh, mighty good stuff there, you know. Amen. 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 The world come. I, I, I've tasted of that, haven't you? Amen. Amen. If you have it, you have it. You're, you're living below your heritage in Christ. Uh, and if you have done that, uh, it, it has got plenty to ramify. I, I recall a, a fellow, a Catholic priest. Now, I don't usually allude to Roman Catholic priest for illustration, but uh, I've no respect to persons if they have something to God, I'm, I'm certainly anxious to get it. <laughs> you know, I said that uh, prove all things old fast, that was good. He was, a, he was a, a relegated in St. Margaret Hospital in Hammond to the, uh, what they call it, the hospice? The, the dying room. They, when you, when you're, you're, you've been consigned to death by the, by the medical staff, they've got a certain room and move you over there hope where you stay not die. And he, he was at that state. And at the uh, Hamilton Times, that's our local paper there in Hamilton, Indiana, interviewed him. And they published it. And it, it blessed my soul. Now, this reporter, I don't know what, what his had a relationship to God, but he just told the facts of the case. But this priest there, and, and 
who, who was facing death, he, he had an interview with him. And he said, the priest said, I'm just like a, a he used the language of the vernacular in the the street. He said, I'm just like a kid waiting for Santa Claus. He said, I, I, I'm going to be with the Lord. He said, I'm, they tell me I'm going, to, going home. And he says, I can hardly wait. <laughs> now, that's faith in action. That's, uh, someone has said, that's dying faith. You don't have that kind, you better, you better show up your, show up your defenses there. Uh, and seek the Lord, because it's appointed the man wants to die. And after death, the judgment. And this faith that I'm talking about will take the triumphal history of both of them. Amen. Triumphal history of both of them. I think of a, I recall the story. I'm going to wind up to talk to one of the rest of them. <laughs> <laughs> Peter in the world to come. 
he was so human and yet so devoted to the Lord. He said, Lord, to whom shall we go? Thou hast the words of eternal life. Amen. The rich, the rich young ruler. Uh, that's another. I agree with that. It says Jesus looking upon him loved. He said that uh, he came running to Jesus. He said, Master, what good thing must I do that I may have eternal life? Well, he was told that he could do the death. Huh? I've always hoped that maybe he changed his mind later. He doesn't say, but I'm, I'm hoping maybe he later was got his repentance and met, met the condition. It said of, um, it said of, of uh, well, we know John Bunyan's and his pilgrim's progress and his uh, very picturesque and effective recounting of, of Christian uh, and his uh, race to the wicked gate <laughs> out there, you know, that uh, we should have committed him, that uh, as he, he was running and his fellow townsmen, they came to the doors and they called to him to come back he forsaken it's, uh, it's an allegory, of course. Now, he had forsaken his former work of fellows and ways of life, and he turned his back on the old life, and he was running toward heaven, which should be the stance of all of us. Stretching forward to that which is before, I uh, press on toward the mark for the prize of the high calling of God. Amen. And so they came to the doors and kept calling to him, <laughs> come back, come back. But the Bunyan has Christian saying, life life, eternal life. That is what it captured his soul. And brethren, that's what I commend to you, that, uh, that, that, you, that, you, uh, that, that I may lay hold. That was the uh, obsess obsessing uh, desire uh, and constraint of the Apostle Paul's life. What things to me, those I have counted lost for Christ, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things, and do count them but dumb. Now, I'll, I'll go with the King James here. I think some of these modern translations are to soften that up. <laughs> I know the American standard says refuse and some of the others just that. But it means that I think that conveys the, the abhorrence with which the apostle regarded these, these former things that he I do count them but dumb, that I may win Christ and be found in him. <laughs> Not having my own righteousness, which is of the law, we heard about that today, which is of the law, but that, which I, I depart from the King James here in the preposition, but that which is through faith in Jesus Christ, not of Jesus Christ, but that which is through faith in Jesus Christ, the righteousness of God, which is by faith, that I may know him and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his suffering. Part of it too. Amen. Being made conformable unto his death, if by any means I might attain unto the resurrection of the dead. And he says, I count not myself to have apprehended. Neither should you, or me, or I. But this one thing I do, this one thing, that's single, single heartedness, this one thing I do, forgetting those things that are behind. And again, I depart from the King James, which says, pressing the elect and you risen, and stretching, forgetting those things that are behind and stretching forward to the things that are before. I press on toward the mark for the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. And he says, that many as be perfect, be thus minded. Amen. May God give us to be thus minded uh, and run with patience the race that is set before us and lay hold on eternal life. Amen. Amen.